I drilled a hole in the bottom of the, the bottom of the tray. There's a frog in the hole and a log in the bottom of the lake. <laughs> Uh, I'll get to that in just a second. A couple things on my list that are housekeeping notes of uh, first, uh, two things on the list, and that is my email newsletter subscription form on my website has finally been fixed. So if you were one of the many people who reached out and said, hey, your email newsletter subscription form is broken, I very much appreciate uh, you taking the time to do that. It took me way too long to get it fixed. The problem was the Google reCAPTCHA thing. Uh, there's a little checkbox where it says, you click, I'm not a robot. And then sometimes you're presented with, you know, like find the boxes that have the street lights or something like that, or the bicycles. Uh, I could never get that to work. I've, I've changed all the settings, redone the, redid the whole recapture thing, could never get that to work. So I finally just said, I'm done with this and switched it over to a double opt-in instead. So now if you go to jayscustomercreations.com slash newsletter and you sign up for my email newsletter, which you should do, um, then you put your, your email address in, you click accept, and then you click submit. You are then sent an email that you have to open up and click on a confirmation link. That's called a double opt-in. So your single opt-in is you just put your information in the form, click accept, and you're, you're on the list. So the double opt-in is to kind of keep the list from getting spammy from um, other people signing you up for something or, uh, you know, robots adding a bunch of bunch of crap to the list. <clears throat> so the email newsletter is fixed. jayscustomcreations.com slash newsletter <laughs> and sign up for that. Getting tongue tied here. The second thing on that little housekeeping list is Facebook video. I have put zero effort into growing my Facebook page over the past three years, something like that. But I do know that there's a, there is an audience over there and it, it's, it's, um, done a little bit differently than, than Facebook. So I, I signed up with a company to take over my Facebook page as far as posting videos. They're not taking it over as far as communicating and, and interacting with people. Uh, they just, what they do is they take my YouTube videos and they re-edit re them so that they're a little bit more condensed, a little bit more you know fast paced typically to cater towards the, the Facebook audience and the Facebook algorithm. So if you're interested, in a little bit different spin on my videos and you do watch Facebook videos, then go to facebook.com slash jaycustomcreations and you'll see a couple that have already been posted. And if I'm not mistaken, the rest of this year, they're gonna try and post a new video every Monday, Wednesday, Friday to kinda get the snowball going, if that makes any sense. So that's the two things on my housekeeping list. This, the next big thing is this tray. And um, wow, that, that video stirred up some engagement. Uh, that was pretty fun. So a hole in the bottom of the tray. Yes, I, I drilled a hole in there. Why did I not drill a hole in there? Well, because I'm an idiot. <laughs> Sometimes it's the simple things, the things that are right in front of me that just go right over my head and I'm oblivious to, right? I just forgot to drill a hole in the bottom of it. Uh, it's not very often that you drill a hole in the bottom of a tray. That just kind of makes no sense to me other than the situation in which these are used. So Here's my theory to the, the, hole in the, the hole in the bottom of the tray, not the hole in the log in the bottom of the lake. <laughs> the hole in the bottom of the tray, my theory, I haven't found any bit of, of documentation to address it. So this is just my theory. You and I as hobby woodworkers, we'll build a box and we'll build a tray to go inside it. And we'll make that tray so tight fitting, but not too tight. That way you just set it in place and it it sinks down on a cushion of air to its final resting place. It's, it doesn't just fall down due to gravity. And that's what's called a piston fit, where you have a pocket of air below the tray and that has to escape around the edges of the tray. Well, the tolerances there are, are such that it won't allow a lot of air to pass fast. So it kind of slides down on a pocket of air. And for little boxes that you and I would make, that would be desired. This is a tray mm -hmm that was made for a chest back in the 1850s. So if you were to be using this chest as an ammunition chest, then, well, first off, you're at war and you're probably trying to get something out of here at, at some type of urgency, right? There's some type of urgency to the situation. You don't wanna be messing with a piston fit drawer. You want this thing to get out of the way if you need something underneath it. So my thinking is, just rationally thinking about the situation, uh, I think they put the hole in the bottom of this thing to stop piston fitting. So it just pulls out without any air resistance. That's the uh, only thing I can come up with. 
I don't think that they would put this in here so they would specifically lose stuff and have <laughs> it fall down in there. Uh, that's not the case. Oh, another thing about holes. It's interesting that they put three holes here for the hand grab. Why didn't they just put a slot? My thinking behind that is, you know, these were built in the 1850s or whenever it was. Um, the, if I'm not mistaken, the United States military, the government, requested one or 10,000 of these. And if you're making 10,000 of these chests, it's going to be a lot easier to use, a, a, you know, a, an auger bit and a brace to drill three holes than it would be to, to you know, have to chisel that out or, or cut that out into a slot. It's just so much more easy, so much easier to accomplish the same thing of making a handle. So I, don't, I just don't think it was necessary to turn the three holes into a slot. So there's that. Now, as far as the expansion and contraction on the bottom, um, no, <laughs> the hole is not to allow for expansion and contraction. The hole is completely irrelevant with expansion and contraction because if these boards are plain sawn boards, then the majority of their expansion and contraction will be left and right in this orientation. And just because there's a hole here does absolutely nothing to prevent this up here and this down here from expanding and contracting along that entire length. Um, so there's that. Also, um, why did, why, why did this not break apart for expansion and contraction? So some, there's, there's two extreme sides to this opinion, or fact, whatever you want to call it, and that some people said that would expansion and contraction, go away, bug, I don't want to inhale you. <clears throat> would expansion and contraction is a myth, way blown out of proportion. First off, it's not a myth. Uh, blown out of proportion, maybe, but uh, I have three examples in my house that uh, have damage from not allowing proper expansion and contraction. Um, well, one of them is not damaged. We'll get into that in just a second. Um, why I think this bottom panel on this one has not broken is I think it was mainly due to the fact that this is all quality air dried lumber. Quality meaning there's no defects in any of this wood. There's no knots whatsoever. Um, I'm not judging by the, the, the amount of growth rings or how tightly spaced, I'm not judging by that at all. There's just no knots in this thing whatsoever. It's solid wood. Every piece of it is straight grain. There's no crazy grain going in any goofy directions. It's all just solid wood. I think it was air dried lumber. And that's the biggest thing there. Um, if I'm, I live in Mississippi and if I buy kiln dried lumber, I've realized over the years that I can't use it right out of the kiln. I, it's too low of a moisture content. I need to have it acclimate to the air here in Mississippi before I build anything out of it because it is stupid humid here in Mississippi. I like to tell people who are not from around here who come here that the summertime, the forecast for the summertime is hot soup. It's like walking into a bowl of hot soup outside. It's borderline miserable in the summertime. Um, so that being said, I can't use kiln dried lumber. And if I was to build something like this tray and take it to, if I was to drive this tray over to Arizona where it's really, really dry, New Mexico where it's really, really dry, then I guarantee you this is gonna crack because this was made, yes, out of air dried lumber, but in a much higher humidity level atmosphere, right? This is already acclimated to this air and I think this could live its entire life here not have any problems whatsoever. Uh, because the, the, the shift, seasonal shift, isn't drastic where I live. It's just not. Um, and I think that's really what made this survive so well, is, is it, it, it spent the majority of its life here in Mississippi, and it was stored in a non-climate-controlled environment, but it was inside of a chest, so you're not going to have massive swings of humidity one way or the other. Um, three examples in my house to just show you that wood movement is a myth. That's a false statement. Um, number one, I have a pine bookcase that I made many years ago, 2013-ish, and I used the least expensive 1x10 pine that I can find. And at that time, the source that I got it from, it wasn't properly dried, I can guarantee you that. And I included some knots in the boards. I didn't cut any of the knots out. I just used the board as is. Well, you can see on the side of this board, uh, the side of this, this uh, bookcase, that the one by 10 that I used, pine, three quarter inch pine, 
cracked all the way along the section closest towards the knot, right? There's definite crack there. Uh, that's one problem. Number two, the, on this particular bookcase, the front face frame, uh, I don't know if there's a nail in that location because I don't remember looking when I took this picture, um, but the front face frame is attached to the side panel in one little spot and the rest of the connection has been broken clean. So I don't know if I glued or if that was a nail location or what, but in that particular location, uh, the wood behind it and on the side panel has broken and splintered off a little bit where it's stuck to the face frame. So you have some wood movement conflicting issues there. That's one example. Uh, another example, something that I did not make, but something we purchased is our dresser in our bedroom. And this is a 15 inch wide panel. Now this is pine and it's got a, some type of a wax finish. Now if you just do a Google image search for Mexican pine furniture, this particular style was all you'll, you'll, you'll see. So we, we bought a bunch of this stuff for our bedroom um, way before I started making YouTube videos. And this is a 15 inch wide panel, like I said, and it's got two distinct cracks in it uh, where it's not allowed to properly expand and contract. Um, this, this particular panel, you can't really see it, but if you run, run your hand across it, you have the center sections of the panel swelling out a little bit, uh, the center boards of the panel swelling out a little bit, and then you have cracks in between those. So I, there's plenty of damage to show you that uh, you shouldn't pin solid wood in, one, in place. It will expand and contract if it changes its, its um, climate, right? So this came from Mexico somewhere. I don't know where it was manufactured in Mexico, but it moved from there to Mississippi, and there's a drastic change along the way, and over the years, we got a definite crack uh, in that particular piece. The third thing that I want to show you doesn't have any damage, but it is a good example of how much wood can expand and contract. So this is the hickory dining table that I made. Uh, this was made with kiln dried lumber. So right out of the kiln, you're looking at what, 7%? And I just, I just used it within a couple days of getting it. The problem is it was way too dry to begin with. So this particular table has a center field that will expand and contract and a breadboard end that is perpendicular to the center field. Well, over the years, uh, I've had to shave an eighth of an inch off of the center field with a hand plane twice. So I've removed a good quarter of an inch of material on both sides. So that's a half inch of material that I have removed from the width of this table. And this is only a 27 inch wide table. It's not a, not a massively wide panel, but I removed that to get it down flush with the end of the breadboard ends. And as I go back to take a picture of this particular table, guess what? The center field is actually a little bit less than, a little bit shrunk down less than the breadboard ends. So climate plays a huge factor. Air dried lumber versus, versus kiln dried lumber plays a huge factor in how much wood is actually going to move. That's basically it for this wood movement saga. I didn't put any nails in here, like I said in the video, because a, a friend of mine who this is going to is going to put some cut nails in there, a little bit more period specific. Uh, that's it for this particular tray for that particular video. Ah, uh, man, my allergies are kicking up. Somebody's burning plastic in my neighborhood. For all of you out there who burn stuff in your yard, please don't burn plastic. Holy smokes. Uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, I'm getting into ham radio. That's a fun little rabbit hole I've recently discovered. Uh, this is a uh, Yesu, I think that's how you pronounce it, Yesu FT60. Um, it's a fun little hobby I'm getting into. So there's that. That's all I got to say. You guys take care, have a great day, and I'll talk to you in the next video.